Hey, welcome to another The Sales Hunter podcast. You see Lee Sauls right there if you're watching online right now. Hello, <laughs> Lee. How you doing? Great, Mark. How you doing? We, great, great. We're going to talk about sell different. We're going to talk, we're going to talk a lot about it. We're going to talk about a lot of things. So you know what? I'm going to hit the video and the voiceover and the music and all that sort of stuff. And let's get the show going. Okay. Let's do it. You're listening to the Sales Hunter Podcast with Mark Hunter, where the focus is to help you as a sales leader sell with confidence and integrity. And now here's your host. Well, that was quick. So, hey, <laughs> Lee, welcome. You, you are Thanks, Mark. You, you are episode number four. How does that make you feel? Batting cleanup. I like it. You, yeah, yes. Uh, there we go. There we go. 20 seconds into a podcast with Lee Sauls, all things baseball. All things baseball. He already gets a baseball term in there. So, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you know, you could have said fourth down, but no, you said cleanup. So, anyway. So, well, can we say that to our Cowboys fans? Oh, no, we shouldn't say that. Oh, I'll tell you what, it, it was not the officiating. It was the Cowboys. Okay. Boom. Drop the mic on that one. I mean, for them to sit there and say it was, no, it was not the official's fault at all. It was the Cowboys fault, bad clock management, bad play management, Blatt. And oh, by the way, I'm broadcasting this from Dallas, Texas. Okay. I have armed guards outside the door. Anyway, hey, back to the show. Lee, welcome. Thank You've got a couple killer books out there. And, um, but more importantly, you, well, once you mention the titles of your book, then I want you to jump into that story that we were talking about when we were in the green room, the, the mythical green room, the mythical green room. So you're talking about sell different, which came out in September, which presents strategies to outsmart, outmaneuver and outsell the competition. And that's the second in the series. The one before that is sales differentiation. So that was the first one in that sales differentiations, uh, series that, Help you differentiate what you sell and how you sell. And you can tell the difference between, because one's a red cover and the other is what, a teal cover? It's like it's teal, a, light blue. Teal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. But hey, yeah, let, let's really talk about. I don't know. What, what, what color do you think this is? I think a teal, light blue. Actually, what I see on screen and what I see here are two different, different things, but that's okay because we like different. It's okay. It's okay. Because we, you know what? We see different. Yeah. So anyway, hey, talk to us. To, Talk to the audience about this fascinating story that you want to share. Sure. So I'm doing a lot of work in this sell different space. This whole idea of looking at every touch point, every interaction you have with a buyer and saying, what is it that I can do different than the competition that my buyer will find meaningful so that they'd rather buy from me at the prices that I want? So I have this client. They're a technology reseller. And they sell primarily in the grocery sector and in the hospitality sector. And they were talking about some of the challenges and the level of competition in that space. And we were looking at every touch point, every interaction that they have. We found two really interesting opportunities, client onboarding and the proposal itself, the document, how you communicate the solution. And the way this really came about was they were showing me a, a recent deal that they're working on and they, sh they just, they didn't intentionally just, but they happened to show the email address of the individual and Mark, it was something, something at AOL.com. Excuse me. Do they know we've turned the calendar on the year 2000? I thought someone turned the lights off on AOL.com. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't even realize AOL.com addresses are still around. Wow. I need to usually like it's our grandparents that, that, that have that help me. How do I turn this thing on anyway? <laughs> so I, I said to my client, I said, based on that email address, what do we know? And we got into this conversation that a lot of times they're not dealing with tech savvy buyers. They're business owners. They own a restaurant. They own a, an individual grocery store, not overly technologically savvy, but recognize the need and importance to have this technology. So what we, we learned was the competitors, when they provide a proposal, it's a couple of pages of a menu, line items of here's the name of the technology, like the model number, and here's the price. And at the bottom, you just sign. And by the way, it's 50, 60, 70, 100, $200,000. So you've got an AOL.com address and you're staring at a menu that might as well be in a foreign language because you have no idea what this thing says. 
and a six figure price tag on it. At least. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we took a step back and we said, where are there opportunities where we can outsmart, outmaneuver and outsell the competition? So we first looked at onboarding and when we talk about client onboarding. It deals with this fear of change. So imagine you're not technologically savvy and you know that you need to do something with technology, but you're really uncomfortable. And a provider comes to you and intrigues you with this technology solution, but then says to you, I'm sure this is scary for you. Anytime you talk about change, it's scary. Well, Can I say put- shiny object, shiny object, squirrel, right. squirrel? Right. Well, we've developed a client onboarding methodology that will step-by-step guide you from where you are today with what you're doing to being fully installed with this new solution that you love so much. Would you like me to walk you through the steps of it? And so they have a, a document, a visual, that they can show someone the phases that the client will go through as they go from where they are today to being fully installed with the new solution. So that's the conversation that they're now having once they start seeing that there's buying signs, that they're intrigued by the solution. At some point, they've got to put pen to paper. And we said, you know, the the competition just has this menu that no one understands. What if we put together a narrative, but not just a narrative in layman's terms, that someone with an AOL address could understand it and understand what they're getting for the dollars that they're about to invest. And now that we've put those two steps in place, their salespeople are having completely different conversations than they ever have before. It used to be, well, this other guy's a nickel cheaper on this and this one's 10% cheaper on that. They're having a completely different conversation than they have ever had before. And it's helping them to win deals at the prices they want. Yeah, I, I want to unpack that because you use the example of the AOL. I can only imagine that the first line of the narrative says, you've got mail. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's a, that's an old line from the 90s anyway. But hey, what, what you're really saying is that you were able to transform this customer because they are now able to communicate with their customers on their terms, in their language. Correct. And you know, what's interesting is that one, you know, you look at the AOL address and yeah, they're not very sophisticated, but how many times I, I can only imagine the number of times that we as salespeople have uh, gone out and, and talked to a customer in, in our language, because we know our product, we know our service so well that right. we think the customer understands it. And they didn't exactly wake up in the morning and say, man, I really hope Lee Sauls calls me today. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe your maybe your mother wakes up and says that, but I I know mine doesn't. So, uh, but yeah, it, it really is. How how do companies how do salespeople go about really understanding? What is that narrative? How do they understand? How, how do they learn? What's the what's the language? What's yeah, the customer well, language? It's a great question. Know? So it's really looking at the client journey. So starting at the very beginning of the, of the process and looking at every touch point, every interaction you have. And saying, okay, what are we doing today? What do we know the competitors are doing today? What do we know about the people we're calling on today? What can we do different with them than what we're doing today that our competitors aren't that the people at the other side of the desk would find meaningful? And there are going to be some areas where you say there's nothing. But chances are you're going to find lots of opportunities along that way to say, you know what? We could be doing something different, meaningfully different. That will give us a leg up on that competition. You so know, that so, means, yeah. I was going to say, because this particular client I'm referring to, they're reselling technology. It's not like someone has this innovative idea and they say, boy, let's make a change to the technology. It's not theirs. They're reselling somebody else's stuff. So they can't differentiate the product any more than the manufacturers provided it. You know, that's fascinating because if you stop thinking about it, they can't change the product one bit. So all they can do is change how they sell. And isn't it interesting? I find it so interesting how so many salespeople blame the product. Oh, if only the product could do this. If only the service could do this. If only the service. And here's a situation you just described. Company, they can't can't change the product. Cannot change the service. So they truly do have to change how they sell. And because they changed how they sell, 
it changes dramatically what the customer hears. I can only imagine uh, when you when you change the narrative like that. I mean, suddenly, I because I, I would imagine their customers are probably looking at multiple options at the same time. A lot of times, yes. And so suddenly what happens is they're seeing them in completely different lights. Because again, this this narrative that they're using is in a completely different language than, than everyone else's. So it naturally makes it easy for them to gravitate towards that. That's a, that's a powerful story. Yeah. And, that's and cool. We peel back a few more layers. Uh, the, so the salespeople want to rush to the demo. They want to show the features and the functions and skip discovery. And and I asked him, you mentioned before I'm a baseball guy. So I said, tell me, what's the batting average when we skip discovery and rush right to the demo? It ain't high, Mark. Uh, <laughs> so baseball, if you go three out of 10, high. you're in the Hall of Fame. They weren't one out of 10. It ain't high. And, and you, you know what, though? You know what's funny? Why is it that salespeople want to skip this? For some reason, they feel if they get to the if they if we just get them to the demo, if they just get them to the demo, and I I argue time and time again, it's about the discovery. The better the discovery, the better the discovery call, the less need there is for a demo. That's very true. That's very true, because if you think about it, the discovery call is asking, right? The demo is seen as telling. So I get to yeah. talk. At yeah. least that's how a lot of salespeople approach it. I'm going to come in and I get to lecture someone for an hour because they asked for a demo, which is a huge mistake. You know, when someone asks for a, a demo or if they ask for a presentation, they're not asking for a soliloquy. They still want it to be a conversation, yeah. which is, again, an opportunity that we have. Man, you man, you just used a big word there, too. It's okay. Soliloquy? Yeah. yeah. I had a good night's sleep last night. So. I, see, I see. Yeah, <laughs> you you slept at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Yeah. I myself just living in a van down by the river, so we, we don't we don't quite use those terms. You play the banjo? But you, but you know what? Something interesting that you said there, and, and, and this is what absolutely drives me crazy, is the demo. And I, and I was listening to a couple of demos. I had a client send me some demo uh, calls. And it was amazing because if you dropped them into chorus or gong or anything like that, you would see that the salesperson doing 90, 95% of the talking. Yeah. And we wonder why demos don't have a higher success rate. If if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be talking 90, 95% of the time, why don't I why don't I just give them a, a YouTube video to watch? Yeah, just I record mean, it and send it to them. Right, and, right. I and mean, then I mean email them the contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Audience participation not required. Yeah. Right. And, and yet that is a real, real problem. So it, in your book or in, in, in your uh, fly, how do we do a better job of linking discovery call to demo? It's uh, I'll give you another big word purpose. So purpose. it's having purpose. That's so not discovery, purpose. That's purpose. OK, not purpose. That's something different. Okay. Purpose, meaning that one of the outcomes I'm looking for during discovery is to acquire the information I need if a demo is part of my, my selling journey, is to have the information that I need to tailor the demo so it's exactly what they want to talk about. And during the demo, I'm asking questions and raising points based on the discovery not just saying, and this feature, when you click this, this turns green, and this turns brown, and this moves left, and this moves right. You can send a video of that. They don't need you to, to facilitate that. But if you make a conversation based on discovery, like you said before, Mark, foundations discovery. I always say, if you think of it in terms of a, of a home, when you're constructing a home, discovery is a foundation. If discovery is weak, so is the rest of the structure. Wow. I like that. I, you know, he, here's, here's some, I, I can't stand demos that are designed to show every aspect of the product or the service. Right. I mean, I look at it this way, the better the discovery call, the shorter the demo, because I'm only going to show you what is relevant to what you need. Absolutely. Why, why share with you everything? I mean, when I get on an airplane, uh, there's a few basic things I need to know where to sit, how to shut up, fasten your seatbelt, <laughs> keep your mask on, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to know all the avionics, avionics, whatever you want to call it, 
of the, of how the plane works. I don't need to know all of the mathematical equations that go into the thrust and everything else. I, I just know what I need to know. Yeah. And but you still need it, to learn how to put on a seatbelt, apparently. Yeah, well, yeah, that, <laughs> that's another story. But you, but you know what's interesting is that if I understood all those other pieces, I probably would say, I don't know if I want to get on the plane. True. Because it's, I, I'd be so overwhelmed. And yeah. this is what this is what demos do. Unfortunately, they absolutely many times wind up confusing. We got a great, great comment uh, from Ken Smith. Your demo needs to be customized to the needs of the customer. Spot on. Correct. Yeah. And that's what the discovery call is all about. Right. You know, so imagine you end that discovery yeah. call, Mark. What? With, so our next step is to show you the software. Um, and here's my thoughts. Based on what we talked about today, Mark, I'm planning to show you A, B, and C. Uh, does that make sense as an approach? Well, I also want to see D, E, and F. Okay, we can certainly do that. Just curious. Why would you like to see D, E, and F? Get some context behind it. Don't just order take. Oh, uh, spot on. Hey, I, I love, don't show up and throw up. Yes, great questions for discovery. Don't have yes or no answers to them. Amen. Because again, it's about a conversation. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is it, this all seems so basic. And yet, as I listen, as I listen to so many demos, the the biggest question I find in demos is, uh, is there anything else that you're not seeing that you want to see? I mean, give me a break. Or are you liking what you're seeing so far? I mean, I mean, it, 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 it's like it's like pass the popcorn. Excuse me. I mean. <laughs> I mean, and then and then when the and then when the sales I'm sorry, I, I'm going on a rant here. When the salesperson says, "Oh, I don't want to do a discovery call unless you have your video camera on," because I want to see if you stay awake because I'm going to be so boring. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm texting while you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Mark, let me ask your opinion on something. Yeah. I, I have a strong opinion on this. So, discovery. The word discovery. Do you ever say to a prospect, "Hey, so our uh, first thing we're going to do is set up a discovery meeting." Yes. Yes. You do. Say I that? actually, I actually do that. See, and, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm completely opposed to that. To me, that says you're about to sit through a sales call, and so I, I don't ever use the word. To me, that's a kitchen item in in the sales arena. That's okay. something that we do. But um, if I'm talking with someone, you know, next up would be to have a a conversation, a consultation, whatever that might be. See, see, if 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 I'm having a conversation with a salesperson who is mm -hmm. in the discovery phase and doing that sort of stuff, I'll, I'll go ahead and use that term because they're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was with a CRO just the other day, and I used that. Hey, I, I got some discovery questions that I want to, and, and and he was actually he was actually engaged and and it worked. Sure, and, and that's his vernacular. But would, but would you counsel the CRO when they're selling a technology solution to? A grocery store to say so. No, the first thing we're going to no. do is set up a discovery call. No, I would tell them to never you ne never use never use the word discovery. But see, this is again going back to understanding who's your customer, yeah. what's the language that they speak, mm -hmm. and that's what's so critical. We don't we don't do it. We go into every sales call using the same language. Oh, I speak French, so I'm going to use French on every customer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Hey, we only got a few minutes left, but I I, I want to hear a few comments. I want to hear a few thoughts ab about your newest book. What, why should, why should people, why should people grab it? Why should people? Oh, there's no reason it? to grab it. <laughs> well, no, you don't want him to grab it. You want him to read it and apply it. Read it and, and apply it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, look, sales has never been tougher for most salespeople than it is today. And it's not just about COVID. It's about when you look at the features and functions of the product that you're selling, it's probably not so revolutionary that no other providers in your space offer it. Others have it. And even if you do have that, we don't look, as, as Mark was talking about earlier, this idea of looking at how we're selling and saying, okay, there, there are nice bells and whistles that, that, uh, that we have nice features and functions, but what more can we do to turn the tide in our favor so that they want to buy from me rather than the alternative? 
So in Sell Different, I have 15 chapters, each chapter dedicated to a strategy that it doesn't matter what you're selling or to whom you're selling, guides you through step by step how to put that into practice. So there is a chapter on discovery. There is a chapter on uh, presentations, virtual selling. Uh, all of these different steps of that journey has nothing to do with what you're selling. I don't talk at all in that book about differentiating a product or service, uh, but getting into how to look at that journey. Starting the very first chapter talks about the buying experience. And I share a story of when my son was being recruited for college baseball because college coaches can't differentiate what they're selling. They can't add a major. They can't move a dorm can't change the meals in the in the cafeteria. So what they have to do is look at the way that they're selling to attract top talent to their university. And I got to tell you, Mark, there's some colleges, coaches are fantastic at it, and some that fail miserably. And what salespeople so often forget, and I don't care what you're selling, how big you are, how small you are, what we forget to do on a regular basis is to make people feel special. Right, typical salespersons having 10, 15, 20, maybe even more sales conversations about what they're selling on any given day. But the person on the other end of the phone is having one with your company. Yeah. One. And we, for us, it's just one more call. It's just one more proposal. It's just one more demo. We forget to make people feel special. And we often talk about, we say sales is a numbers game. And I only partially subscribe to that because if you exclusively see it through that lens, you treat people like a number yeah. and no one likes to be treated like a number. And it so, sure sounds like the comments we're getting that Michaela has read your book there. So I love oh, it. Let's see. Oh, yes. I, the part. I, yes, I love that. 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 Michaela we get, gets we, a star. Yeah. We've got more comments. Hey, we got a lot of comments. We got a lot of comments coming in, but I'll tell you what, I don't got a chance to put a few of them up on the screen, but we are running out of time. Uh, People want to get in touch with you. Now, hey, the way the show works, don't don't think we're, we're ending because we got an after the show show here. But I do want to get a little plug in for you because how do people get in touch with you? How do you people buy you do is If you go to selldifferencebook.com, selldifferentbook.com, you can actually download the first chapter. You can read it or you can also listen to the first chapter for free. And if you'd say, boy, this is the right book for me. After you buy it, doesn't matter where, come back to that website. And there's a video series that I put together. It's the Sales Differentiation Minute, Volume 2. Uh, just sign up on the website once you bought the book. And every week for a year, you'll get a link to a video to help you implement those strategies. Hey, that is, that is pretty cool. And your, your website is what? I mean, salesarchitects. You know, Dot com but salesarchitects.com. I love yep. that. I love that. Hey, would you do me a favor? Would you stick around for the after the show show? I can, but I can't see that fast three times. Well, <laughs> now for the after the show show, because the after the show show starts right after this video. Hey, you've been listening to the Sales Hunter podcast. I'm Mark Hunter. It's always an honor. It's a privilege to bring a new guest each week. And hey, if you haven't checked out the saleshunter.com website, check it out. Back to the after the show show with Lee Sauls. Lee, there he is. I'm back. I'm back. Hey, so you just got back from Maui, right? I did. Yeah. And you live in Minnesota. Yes. And we're recording this in January. Yes. <laughs> That's a good time to go to Maui. Very good it's time. It's not a good time to come back from Maui. Just saying. Awful. Awful. Great time to go. Not the right time to come back. Should have stayed longer. We'd we'll <sighs> love to have stayed longer. Paradise. As, as an ex-resident of the Twin Cities, I know what you're going through in January. Yes. I, 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 can, I can feel your pain. Well, How much snow you... have you got on the ground right now? And what's yes. the temperature outside? Oh, let's see. What do we got temperature-wise? I'll tell you what's coming because I was looking at that the other day. And so let's see here. We got about six inches on the ground. Okay. That's nothing. That's nothing for you guys. Now, today is going to be 31. Oh, 31. Hey, a balmy tomorrow, 31. Now, get your baby. Tomorrow's going to get interesting. Tomorrow is going to be 36. Mark, going down to minus four. I love it. Wednesday goes down to minus 16. I love it. And Thursday's high is zero going down to minus 11. 
Thanks for reminding me of where I lived. <laughs> I will never forget when I lived in the Twin Cities. And all I can say is I was so glad that the company I worked for provided me with an with an underground parking spot. Because oh, yes. it was nice to be able to go from my garage at home to the underground parking garage at work and not have to step outside for six months out of the year. No, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, hey the Twin Cities are a great place to live. Business, business good for you? It's wonderful. wonderful. Good. You're having fun? Having a blast. And I've pictures... always said if I have to use an alarm clock to get up, something's wrong. I haven't something's used an alarm wrong. clock in ages. And pitchers and catchers will report. We're going to get the strike behind us. Oh, wow. We heard just a sigh there from Lee because we struck a chord because he I'm, is. Mr. I'm not baseball. a happy camper. I'm thankful I've got two sons playing college baseball, and I know that there's no strike, there's no lockout. So they're already practicing and they'll be playing ball. One, one of the boys in Florida, one in Arizona. I love it. Hey, wow. Mikhail is from hey. here. Yes, Michaela's from from the Hopkins. Yes, yes. So, Hopkins. Michael, I'm in Maple Grove, about 20 minutes away. Go. Well, and I used to live in Egan. That was many, many moons yeah. ago. Now, now I'm residing down in Dallas, where it's a little bit warmer. So anyway, hey, we've got to run. We've got to end this episode, but you've been listening to the Sales Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hunter. Each week, we bring you a new guest. And this week's guest, Lee Sauls, and his magnificent book, The Book to get is by going to salesdifferentbook.com. Correct, Lee? No, no, sell different. Oh, I'm sell, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sell. Mix the two books up, Mark. Sell different <laughs> different book dot, com. Sell yeah. different book dot com. Okay. You got it. Thanks so much. We're out of here. Take care.